This is very nice. It's a long time ago that I came to stage and people were booing and so So this is a, it's a good start. Thank you. Uh, let me see. Before I start, I, I have to give you always this. And uh, I, I'm probably going to say very little that has to do with my uh, potential conflicts of interest. But uh, in a way, I'm, I'm proud that we still can work with the pharmaceutical industry because the rest of psychiatry, actually, industry is not interested anymore because nothing is happening there. And in addiction, it seems that uh, we're still uh, interesting to them. So I think that's uh, in itself a good idea. So this is the topics that I want to cover with you a little bit. And it's uh, uh, a little bit talking about the neurobiology, but neurobiology for dummies. Not because you're dumb, but because that's the level of my understanding. Uh, then say a few words about all the news that there is. And there is a lot of new. Uh, and that is not only that there's new medications and new psychotherapies, but it's also that there are new treatment goals. Instead of the old story of, if you don't want to become abstinent, you're not for us. Uh, you have to stop drinking, otherwise I can't help you. So now we have reduced drinking programs, and I'll say a few things on that. There's also something like we were always saying people have to stop and they have to do it on their own. And, uh, and we're not going to substitute. And I think there are some indication that substitution treatment, as it's so well known in uh, the treatment of people with, uh, with opiate addiction, there is some new developments in, uh, in what you could call substitution treatment. And then there is the big issue, this is the big elephant in the room, and that is all these things work, but they all work a little bit for a l few people. So how can we make the exact sizes bigger? And we have to talk about compliance, how we do that. We have to talk about polypharmacy, maybe giving many different medications at the same time. And the most important and scientifically most exciting thing is maybe we have to know what kind of patients need which treatment in which circumstance. And that is what we call personalized treatment or personalized medicine. And, and finally, there are some new things, and that is something like uh, brain modulation, deep brain stimulation, transcranial magnetic stimulation, and a new thing kit on the block, and that is psychedelics. Psychedelics not for recreational use, but for treatment of people with, uh, with addiction. So it's a lot to cover, and I'm going to go fast, but you will have available my slides if you can make them available. So uh, first of all, addiction is, I see it, is a brain disease, or let's say it's also a brain disease. It's a neurobiological disorder with both biological, psychological, and social roots. But at the end, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a brain disorder. It's a treatable brain disorder. It's not like dementia like now. It's a treatable brain disorder. And why do I say that? Uh, one of the reasons is that you can show clearly, and we know it for sure by now, is that uh, Genetics play an important role in the development of addiction. And uh, this is just to show a few things. Uh, the contribution of genetics is anywhere between 40 and 60 percent, which still leaves another 50 percent for social facts and psychological factors. But genetics is very strong in, in, in addiction. And how can you think about it? It's a complex picture, but uh, it's very easy to explain. I see the, the face is going like this. Uh, this is the genetics, the genotype, that is what you're born with. And if everybody has a slightly different genotype, and that translates itself into you're being born with a slightly different brain. And you know that from early on, you have kids that are very impulsive, you have kids that are very easily satisfied, but you also have kids that are not so easily satisfied. And some one of these things we call reward efficiency. That is kids that are born with, and you can say, fewer dopamine receptors in their reward and motivational system in the brain. There's also kids that are very impulsive. They're not good in conflict monitoring. What that means is that they always go for the immediate reward. They can't postpone. And, and if you want to see that, you can go to, uh, to YouTube, and then you go to the, uh, the marshmallow test. So we're born different, and that's what we call, we can't observe it directly in the behavior, but if you look in the brain, and that's why we call it the endophenotype, it's under the phenotype, endo, and if you're born with this kind of a brain, it doesn't mean that you become an alcoholic or a drug addict, but the probability that you become under negative circumstances is bigger. And the negative circumstance is here called 
epigenetic influence, because it's a picture from a geneticist, and a geneticist has difficulties with the word environment. They find it difficult, the word environment, so they say epigenetic influence. And of course, if you're moving into that situation, you start to use drugs, the brain is also going to change due to the use of drugs. So that is the model that we have, and it means that we have people with addictions have a slightly different brain functions, and we know from animal research and new research with neuroimaging from humans, that is related to certain brain structures. And the funny thing is also to neurotransmitters. And if it's related to neurotransmitters, messengers, uh, compounds in the brain, then maybe you can also find medications that affect these neurotransmitters. So that's the idea about the model, that you have psychological functions, and maybe you can do something with psychotherapy, you have brain uh, structures, and you have neurotransmitters. So there's maybe something to do with psychotherapy, and maybe also with pharmacotherapy. So this is what it is. And what are the main disturbances of the functions in the brain? Actually, that is, oh, yeah, that's this one. Actually, if you want to describe an addict, I would say, it's maybe I'm not allowed to say, but it's actually people who never grow over adolescence. It's people that have a very hypersensitive motivational system, reward system. They want something they want it now. And they have a deficient cognitive control system. If they feel an impulse, they cannot control that impulse. And you recognize that is actually the, the situation of an adolescent. If, if you have a kid at home that is 13, 14, that's what he is. He is hyper-motivational and not very good in controlling his, uh, his uh, 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 impulses. And so that system has been translated to Nora Volkov in this very complex picture, but it basically tells you this, that the combination of this hypersensitivity for potential reward in combination with the deficient control makes people excessively using drugs and relapse after they actually stopped using. I, I made the picture a little easier, and so I make it like this. So some people, if they use drugs or alcohol, I'm going to talk about alcohol, you think it's not important, but alcohol and tobacco are the killers in the world. Drugs are a small thing compared to that. Uh, alcohol is the main thing in violence and, 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 and uh, criminality. It's, it's not drugs. Organized crime, that, that is the drugs. They're, that's for organized crime. So this is my biological model. It's people who are vulnerable to become addicted after repeated report, they get something in the brain that is called attentional bias. If they see something in the surroundings that was related once to the use of drugs, their brain gets sensitized. If they see something in the environment, uh, for example, we, we have uh, uh, heroin users and they, they smoke the heroin. And so if you have a chewing gum and you throw away your paper from the chewing gum that looks like aluminum foil, they see it immediately because their brain is biased, they have an attentional bias. So they see these signals everywhere around you. Try to match you with an al uh, as an alcoholic. There is science of alcohol everywhere in the world, all day, everywhere. So their brain is sensitized. So if there's a drug-related stimulus, their brain gets attached to that. They see it immediately. And you see them sometimes, they, they get restless. What happens in the brain is what we call Q-reactivity, which means that the motivational system in the brain gets activated. Now, OK, who cares? It gets activated. The subjective experience is craving of that activation. So people feel the craving, and they want to use. But of course, we're not rats, we're human beings. So if we feel the craving, maybe we can control that cognitively. We don't have to do what we feel. We can decide otherwise. Not if you have a brain that is not cognitive layer, because you don't notice this conflict that there is. You want to use, but you know, Immediate effect is wonderful, but you know the long-term effects might be detrimental. So people with an addiction, they don't have such a good conflict monitoring. They go immediately for the, the reward. And even if they make the balance, they also don't have such a good motor impulsivity. 
the moment they want to do the action, they already do it. So motor impulsivity is a problem. So although they get a nice warning of the craving, which tells them, get out of here, they don't do it because the cognitive control system is not there. And so they relapse. I use this model because I want to show that what we can do with our in the medications and our psychotherapy. This is what we normally thought about addiction. But in alcohol, and currently we start to think also more in some of the, uh, uh, the drug addictions, there is something new. In the beginning, people really want to use alcohol and drugs for the kick, for the pleasure. So you could say that is what you call positive reinforcement. But with time, a lot of people experience negative consequences, they experience withdrawal, and they start to use drugs more and more to get rid of the negative feelings. So what we call negative reinforcement. And at the end, people basically use because they use. It's a kind of habit formation. You just do it while you do it. Think about a chain smoker. He's smoking all the time. There's no pleasure, there's nothing. It's just this is his behavior, which is very difficult to stop. So this is what happens. People often start with impulsive use, which is positive re reinforcement, and slowly they progress into compulsive use. They use because they get rid of the negative symptoms. And the interesting thing is different parts of the brain and different neurotransmitters are involved in these two processes. So the picture is a little bit more complex. It's not just the drug-related stimulus that can actually set this in motion, but it's also the stress and withdrawal that people uh, experience that can set in motion this attentional bias, curativity, craving, and then relapse. So what is so nice about this model? Because you can start to think how you can actually interfere in that whole process. So think about it, for example, if you could give an antagonist a medication that blocks the effect, for example, of opiates, naltrexone, and you do it long enough, maybe this attentional bias actually fades away if you do it long enough. Uh, so, and then the whole process doesn't start anymore. Would be very nice. You can also think about reducing the stress. If you can have stress reduction, maybe you don't have this cure activity due to the stress. Maybe you can also do something directly about the craving, anti-craving medication. Or maybe you can think if this interventions on the hyperactive motivational system don't work, maybe we go to improving the cognitive control system. So we start to give cognitive enhancers. Who can think of a cognitive enhancer? Something that improves your cognition. Ritalin. Isn't that one? Methylphenidate, I have to say, because I have not allowed to say any. Uh, and finally, if all that not works, maybe you go to substitution treatment, the agonist treatment. So this is the model that we have. And so if we start to look at alcohol use disorder, then so we have agonists. We have naltrexone, nalmethine, and these are opiate antagonists. And if you use alcohol and you have nalmethine or naltrexone on board, you don't have the pleasant experience of the alcohol, at least much less. Or you can give disulfiram, antabuse, not only don't feel uh, so much of the pleasure, you even get a negative. This is what doctors like the most. They say I treat it, but at the same time they punish you. It's not such a nice medication. It's registered. If you would bring it to the market now, it would never be registered because of the side effects. But the side effects is actually the counter conditioning that you want. So we have three medications here. Here we have the anti-stress. There's a very interesting medication. It's an antihypertensive against high blood pressure. It's a doxazosine. It's an alpha adrenergic drug. You can forget all the details. It's about the, the idea. We have actually some nice anti-craving drugs. A camprosase, the one that are in bold and red. These are registered. So they're approved by the EMA, the European Medicines Agency for the indication. But we have also topiramate, which is an anti-epileptic, that probably is the most effective for all our, all our medications in alcohol dependence. It's not registered yet, and I'll come to that. We might have you can use baclofen there, which is a GABA B agonist. Probably that is one of these substitutions, maybe also, in high doses. We have varenicolin, which is named Champix, which is an anti-smoke medication. 
So these all are known to do something in the craving. Now, cognitive enhancer. I think you could think about uh, methylphenidate, but modafinil is probably a better one. It's the Americans don't like to say that it's a stimulant. They sell a wakefulness-promoting drug. <laughs> Sounds less dangerous, isn't it? Actually, it was developed for the American Army that um, uh, fighter uh, pilots they could fly longer if they used modafinil, and it was less strong than amphetamines, so they weren't becoming trigger happy. So that's why they developed modafinil. It's an interesting medication. I also put here, but I'm not sure that it belongs there, LSD and psilocybin. So it's, uh, I'll come to that. And finally, we have agonist treatment. And you wanted to say some agonist is something like substitution treatment. There's a little difference in definitions. You can talk about it long, but it's basically thinking about that. And uh, we have a few. Baclofen, sodium oxabate, GHB, uh, used extensively in Italy and Austria, not in other countries. Gabapentin, which is an anti-epileptic drug. It's probably not a direct agonist, but it works uh, as such. And then it's C2H5OH, which is alcohol. I'll come back to that. So you see, we have a nice repertoire of medications that can be used to treat alcohol dependence. But you also see that there's only four of these 10 that are approved by the European Medicines Agency. All the others, there are good studies about it, but they're not registered. So this is what we have, many medications, uh, and we can do a lot. Uh, the only thing is, as I said, uh, they're not all registered. Uh, Many of these drugs are used for other indications. They're out of patent. Uh, it means that for pharmaceutical industry, it's very difficult to, uh, to test them and to bring them to the market. Uh, so it is very unlikely that they come to the market. And that means that uh, therapists, doctors, maybe cannot use them, except if we start to be active. And we don't leave it to the EMA. We start to say, OK, as professional organizations, as uh, patient organization, we demand these medications. We want that non-registered medication with enough scientific support become available. And we make sure that we put these medications in our treatment guidelines. And if they're in our treatment guidelines, maybe we can start to prescribe them off-label. Of course, we do it very decent with full uh, 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 agreement with the patient and of course with monitoring the, the, the ongoing course, but we have to do something there. Otherwise, they will not come available. So this is an activist program to see whether we can overcome that situation that pharmaceutical industries are not going to bring these medications to the market. How is it with psychotherapy? It's also an exciting time. It was a little slow for a long time. And why can I talk about psychotherapy while I'm using a model from biology. Uh, I want to show you just for fun a, uh, a study that was done not so long ago, what was it, 2011. And they, it's a study on, on motivational interviewing. And as you may know, motivational interviewing was developed many years ago, and it developed into a kind of motivation that tries to bring people from, uh, to change talk, to let them say, I want to change in this direction, I want to do this. But of course, if you're in a treatment and you're ambivalent about whether you want to stop or reduce drinking, you say, but, this is too difficult, but, my wife died it so many times, but, this is what you call counter-change talk. And you want to move people from counter-change talk to change talk. And so what they did is they, they, they did motivational interviewing with, uh, with alcohol-dependent patients, and they were recording what these patients were saying. And they had change talk and counter-change talk. And then they put them in the scanner, in an MRI scanner, and they gave them a drop of alcohol, and they made them listen to their own change talk and their own counter-change talk. And this is what you see then. Uh, if they listen to counter-change talk, their own counter-change talk, you see a lot of activation in the brain, and basically in the insulate and the singlet cortex, which are areas in the brain that are strongly related to craving. 
Whereas if they listen to their own counter-change talk, you see it's very silent. It's nice, isn't it? So you do a psychological intervention and you see a biological effects of that. So I think that the biological model that I showed you, we can also use actually for thinking about treatment with psychological interventions. So this is one, counter conditioning. It's very difficult. They try to do things now, but you know counter conditioning, probably some of you know, they're just as old as I am. They know the periods that they tried to change homosexuals and heterosexuals by giving them electroshocks on their penis. It didn't work. It shouldn't have worked, and happily it didn't work, because it's unethical. But there is modern changes in, in this counter conditioning that might come available. Reducing stress, cognitive behavior therapy, and the new one now on the block is, of course, mindfulness. Mindfulness is a new, and the, the fun thing is a lot of people don't like CBT, but mindfulness a lot of people do like, because we have a lot of interventions, but we also have a lot of interventions that people don't want. And this is one that at least some of the population wants. And they want it for a longer time. They do it and some actually develop it as a kind of a lifestyle in which they, every day they do some uh, uh, mindfulness. Uh, this is another one that can do something about craving. This is Q exposure therapy, CET. Uh, it's not so effective, but in combination with a very specific medication, dicycloserine, there might be very interesting effects. Dicyclosiren is actually making your memory a little bit more fluid, so we're all stuck with our own memories and our own memories about drug use. And if you do a certain intervention, while you make the memory system a little bit more fluid, then maybe you can make better changes. So this is an interesting way of combining psychotherapy and pharmacotherapy. ACT is acceptance and commitment therapy. A lot of people don't like cognitive behavior therapy because it's saying, get rid of your craving. Craving is bad. Acceptance and commitment says, accept your craving. It's there. It doesn't mean that you have to act on it. You see, it feels a little bit also more like the, uh, the mindfulness. Acceptance and commitment. Again, I don't say it's more effective than ACT, but a lot of people like it much better because it's more mellow, it's more fitting to certain people. And that's, of course, the question, who fits what the best? Of course, there is also mindfulness-based relapse prevention, and some people start to think about EMDR. You know, these people with, with post-traumatic stress disorder, they get an EMDR, a, a treatment, a behavioral treatment. And now we say, with PTSD, you have intrusive thoughts about the trauma. You can also think about craving as intrusive thoughts that you don't want, but they come up all the time again. So maybe we can use EMDR. So it's a very interesting development. Uh, of course, you can think about improving our cognition with uh, motivational enhancement therapy, which I mentioned already, but also with working memory training. Maybe we can just train instead of getting muscles, getting the prefrontal cortex a little bit uh, stronger. And finally, of course, you can also think about agonist treatment, give people pleasant things instead of the drugs, substituting uh, the drug with pleasant activities by uh, contingency management, you pay people for good behavior, or by community reinforcement approach. So you see, we have a lot of options actually available for the treatment, both psychological and pharmacological in the treatment of alcohol dependence. So that is why we we'll conclude, but, but, do patients and therapists want all these treatments? Do they really like to do it? And we have to think about that. Maybe they don't like abstinence, but like reduced drinking. Uh, people, patients like agonist treatment. A lot of them don't like ag ant uh, antagonist treatment. The thing that take away the pleasure. Uh, people don't want to change. Maybe they want acceptance. So we have to look at that. And how effective are these interventions? So I'll go into these issues new treatment goals. The big thing in alcohol treatment is we have the treatments available, but they're not being used. I'm going back to you, Giovanna. This is, this is the big issue. We have them available, and they're not being used because of all the people that have alcohol dependence and could benefit from treatment, only 8% get that treatment. So the treatment gap is 92%. And what are the reasons for the treatment gap? The biggest reason that patients give for that is 
they're not ready to stop using. So they say, I want, I want to change. Maybe I want to reduce, but I don't want to stop. I'm not ready to stop. And if you look in the literature, then it seems that about half of the patients that come to the treatment, they want to stop, but the other half say, I'm not going to stop. I, I, I'm willing to reduce. Until reasons, these people who wanted to reduce and not to stop, they were sent away. You're not motivated, that is what they call, so we can't help you. And so that has been changed now. So we need medications and treatments that actually can help people who want to change, to reduce, but not to want to stop. And so it's very nice that a few years ago we had the first medication that was actually tested for reduced drinking. And that was Nelmifine, an opiate and tech. I have to be careful because it was, I was involved in the development of that, so uh, don't believe me. That was Nelmifine. It's registered in Europe, and uh, uh, you have to only take it as needed. So if you think you come to a risk of situation, you take a tablet. And probably it doesn't stop you from using, but it stops you from excessive using. So this is a nice medication. And by now, if you look at all the other medications that I mentioned, and here they're in, in, in there's a lot of other ones that can be used to reduce drinking. Topiramate is probably one of the most effective ones there, but also gabapentin, modafinil, varenicline, and doxacine. They're medications that we can use for reduced drinking. So that is a, a nice development. Some people have said reduced drinking, you can do it, but only for the less severe ones, the people who don't drink too much. Now there is coming up, I'm not allowed to, I'm allowed to say it, in addiction, a paper that tells you it's for all people. All people, even if you are a very heavy drinker, you can have also success and long-term success, sustained effects of reduced drinking. So I think it's a good message. If you want to stop completely, it's a very good case, but if you only want to reduce, we're going to help you to reduce. Substitution treatment. This is maybe David Nutt has been here. And this is statement of David Nutt from, uh, th I think, two years ago. And uh, he said, Western society will give up alcohol within a generation, leading drug scientists claim, that's what he said, that he was busy at that time with developing what he called Alcosynth. He said, I'm going to make something that feels like alcohol, that has everything like alcohol, but you don't have a hangover. And maybe you thought, I'm also, you're also not going to be addicted to it. I think when I was reading this, and uh, I don't hear much from him about it anymore, I think it is on the market already. And the drug is called GHB. If you have GHB, it feels like alcohol. You have to be a little careful because the therapeutic window is small. But if you actually get drunk on GHB or you get a GHB-induced coma, you wake up crystal clear without a headache, without a hangover. So I think you don't hear him about it anymore because it's already there. Maybe he wants to give a nice taste to it. But, uh, so... But the idea was very good. Maybe we have substitution treatment. So this is what he and Jonathan Chicks have been saying. Can we have something like substitution treatment? Some other people have, have said maybe not. But this is what you actually need. You need an agonist. Now, alcohol is a very difficult molecule. It, it goes to all kinds of receptors. It's, it's a very difficult molecule. It's not like, uh, like heroin that goes to the mu opiate receptor. It's a very difficult molecule, but it definitely goes good to the GABA receptors. And, and there are medications that, that do something with the GABA receptors. So you need an agonist. You can use it orally, and it should work a little longer, and it should have low toxicity. That is what you... And, and so, of course, there should be safety measures. Now the question is, do we have these medications? Let me see. Is this... Yeah, we have them. Baclofen is an agonist. GABA bay agonist, sodium oxabate, GABA bay agonist, and GABA pendant. It does something with the GABA system, but probably not directly on the receptor. So here we have three medications that could be used. They're not registered for that indication yet, but that could be used potentially in the treatment of alcohol dependence. And this is reviews. I wrote this review on, uh, on sodium oxabate, and I was involved in these reviews on, on baclofen. So we have a lot of knowledge there, and so, but they're not in the guidelines, so it's not easy to give them off-label prescriptions. Uh, this is baclofen. You see there's a lot of studies, and baclofen is an effective treatment, probably mainly in reducing uh, uh, heavy drinking, not so much leading to abstinence. 
This is maybe even for some patients a more important one. And that is this prescription, prescription supplying of real alcohol to homeless people that drink a lot, that have a lot of uh, uh, emergency department visits because of all kinds of problems and have a lot of police contacts. And so in Canada it has been developed that homeless people who drink more than 40 units a day, we start to give them something to do and they can get some alcohol every hour. And they reduce the drinking from 40 to 60 drinks to 30 drinks. It's not a healthy amount, 30 drinks. Don't, don't go to 30 drinks. But it's better, 30 drinks is better than 60 drinks. And also what you see is big reductions in emergency department visits and big reductions in visits uh, to the, of, of uh, contacts with the police. So I think that's also an agonist, also a substitution treatment for a very specific population. And I think we should start to think on this uh, special population to do it. And here comes the big thing. How effective are these treatments? And I have to, I have another five, six minutes. How effective are these treatments? And that's the shit. Because for a campersate, the numbers needed to treat is about 10 to 20. So you have to treat 10 patients or 11 patients who have one patient who is responding. And with naltrexone, it's about 11. And if you go to nelmifene, and here it's not numbers needed. Number needed to treat, this is effect size. And effect size, it's small when, it, when it's between 0.20 and 0.50. It's moderate when it's 0.50 to 0.80. And it's big if it's bigger than 0.80. And so you see the effect sizes of nelmifene. It is between 0.30 and 0.50, which is a small effect size. So you can say, okay, see, that other alcohol treatments are maybe even a little smaller. So maybe you say, alcohol dependence is not a medical disease. You shouldn't treat it with, med with medication. But if you look at antidepressants, the effects are not bigger, 0.24 to 0.35. Or to psychosis, the effects are bigger. Maybe you should say, altogether, psychiatry doesn't belong to medicine. You shouldn't treat it with medications. But then if you see this, and I want just to show you this, this is in comparison to medications that have been used by internal medicine doctors and, and primary care physicians. And this is medications who have been used in, in, in psychiatry. And this is the effect size, so how higher, how stronger the effect is. And you see, overall, mean effect in what your internist or your GP is using, the overall effect size is 0.45, small effect also in general medicine. The mean effect size in psychiatry is in point, point 0.49. So it's the same. So the whole medicine maybe is not effective. That's what the doctor don't tell you, but we belong to medicine because we also have small effects. Uh, now you might say, and this is the alcohol there in the middle, so we're really in the middle. Now I say maybe psychotherapy is better. I'm not going to show you the data, but psych oh, psychotherapy, I have to go one further. Psychotherapy is in the same range, small effect sizes. So whether you give pharmacotherapy or you give psychotherapy to alcohols, it works, but only in a few patients because the effect size is small. And it's the same in the rest of medicine. So what do we have to do? Can we do better? So this is possible solutions. One is Medications only work if you take them. So we have to improve compliance. So one way to do it is to give long-acting long medications. You take naltrexone implants, which works for a month or three months or six months. That could be improving compliance. You can also combine pharmacotherapy with psychotherapy. And there's some indication if you add medications to psychotherapy, it improves the effect. The other way around, it's not so clear. You can combine different medications. There are fields in medicine where you always combine 30 seconds. The best thing you can do is find ways to give the right medication to the right patient. That's what we call patient treatment matching. And I'll give you just a few examples, and because I have to go very quickly. This is, for example, a very nice one. We can do it at the clinical level. We can ask an alcoholic 
if he likes very sweet things, sweet liking, we know it has something to do with the, uh, the, uh, the opiate system in the brain. If you are, are a very, very, very sweet liking person, the effect of uh, naltrexone in the treatment of alcohol dependence is much bigger. So maybe only the ones, and it's only 10% of the population, that likes that very sweet, they should get naltrexone. And other alcoholics need some other medication. This is uh, another very interesting one. This was pathological gambling. We knew this with modafinil. If you have pathological gamblers that are very impulsive, they do much better on modafinil. Maybe it's me, so it will shut down one time. If they're not impulsive, they actually they become more and more impulsive and they relapse. And we did the same with alcohol-dependent patients. And if they were impulsive, they became less impulsive and they did re didn't relapse anymore. If they were not impulsive, actually impulsivity increased and they relapsed more often. So it's not, if it doesn't benefit, it doesn't harm now. You have to select very carefully what kind of patients you give, what kind of medication. Uh, this is probably the most interesting one of all of them. Just want to show you this. This is uh, patients uh, that have certain genes. Genes are very easy to measure. They're also very cheap by now. And they're stable. If you have it, it never changes. So it's easy to, to have it. If you see the difference in effect of naltrexone with the blue one, which is the non-good uh, genetic variant, the effect size is small. You need seven or eight patients to be treated to have one patient with a good response. If you have the gene, the other gene variant, you need only three patients to treat to have one effect. So you see a big increase in the effectiveness. So that's what we have to look for. And there are many examples of that, which I'm not going through, and you can read it all. Here, for example, is topiramate. And here's topiramate. And you see, over the whole population, the red one, the placebo, they have more... Uh, uh, the green have more, less drinking, heavy drinking days per week than the red, the placebo. Uh, but that is due to only one small, not so small subgroup, a subgroup of 42% with a certain gene. If you have the other genes, you see there is no effect of the medication. So if we can just say, if you have the CC variant of the Greek 1 gene, you're going to get to pyramid. And the chance that you're going to be effective on that medication is very big. So this is the development that we have, uh, and, and that is going to change. And the picture that I showed you over our effective medications, either to get abstinence or reduce drinking, these are the medications. The one in bold are registered, the one not in bold are not registered, but we should have them at a certain time. And you see there are indications under them. So if you want to give naltrexone, it works the best in people with antisocial behavior. It works the best with people with sweet liking, SL. It works good in people with a family history of alcohol dependence. And it works very good in people with a certain variation of the opiate, mu opiate receptor gene. And so you can go all the way. And so we know now much better which patients need what kind of medication. So that's going to change the world. Uh, okay. Maybe I should. Here is something went wrong. So maybe I should stop here. There's two other things that are going on. That's one is neuromodulation, uh, and I'm not going to talk about. But the other thing is very interesting is uh, uh, psychedelics. I think in psychiatry, in general, it's, they're, they're becoming more interested in it. For example, for the treatment of suicidality and depression, ketamine is, uh, is one of the new, uh, very promising drugs together with psilocybin. I think in history we have very nice studies on the effects of LSD in the treatment of, uh, of uh, uh, alcohol dependence until LSD was forbidden and so the whole research uh, came to a standstill. But I think this is coming back and so psychedelics are going to be back in, uh, in, in psychiatry and in the treatment of uh, addiction. And so I think that we can now say that uh, addiction is a... Uh, is a treatable brain disease, and that we have a lot of medications available. We have a lot of new psychotherapies available. The effect sizes of these treatments are not as we wanted to have them. Uh, and not everybody wants this treatment, but with the introduction of reduced drinking in addition to total abstinence, and with the introduction of 
psychotherapies that people like more, like mindfulness-based intervention or acceptance and commitment based And with the introduction of personalized medicine, I think the future is bright and we can do a lot. And like in prevention, we don't do a lot of that. It's not that we haven't anything, but we have to start doing the things that we have evidence for. And uh, we, uh, I think there's two major things that have, have to happen. One is that the, the, the training of doctors, basically also primary care doctors and psychologists, has to be improved because they just don't know anything. I don't know why it is. I, in, in the standards of the, the Dutch general practitioner, it says doctors that feel competent to treat uh, alcohol dependence with medication can do so. Try to imagine that you would say doctors that feel competent to treat diabetes mellitus can use medication. That would be ridiculous. So GPs have to take responsibility and the organizations have to take responsibility and we have to get rid of stigmatization. And if that happens, I think we have a bright future. Thank you very much.